Every day when we're on the road, people around us endanger themselves and others by using their phones while driving. They think they're hiding it, but we've all seen them and know exactly who they are. For instance, there's a sneak a peeker who darts their eyes between the road and their text. There's also the got a ticketer looking upset because they just got a ticket for using their phone while driving. And what about the fast scroller who can't drive five minutes without updating their social media feeds? Or the night lighter who has that mysterious glow illuminating the inside of their car after dark? Do any of these sound familiar? If they remind you of yourself or someone you know, rethink your behavior before you find yourself becoming the fender benderer, the veering off the rotor, or worst of all, the driver who killed someone. Put the phone away or pay. Paid for by NHTSA. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I heard that for a limited time, all Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless service online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Hello and welcome to the Publicly Challenged Podcast. I'm your host, Luke Oswald, and I hope you join me on my quest for knowledge to become a better public land hunter, angler, and forager. Stick with this and who knows, maybe we will learn something together. All right, real quick before we get started on the show, I'm just going to talk about Treeline Academy. You've heard me say it. I can't even tell you how many times. Um, Mark Levesay is treelineacademy.net. That's treelineacademy.net. Sign up. Use the promo code PC2020. Save yourself 20 bucks. Can't say it enough. It's awesome. Amazing. Most comprehensive e-scouting course out there. Check it out for yourself. Sign up. Use promo code PC2020. And now let's get to the show. Okay, so I'm sitting here with Larry White. And uh, Larry, you want to go ahead and introduce yourself for everybody listening? Yeah, uh, name's Larry White. Live in the low country in South Carolina. I run the uh, Wild Game Cooking Blog, Wild Game Gourmet. Uh, professional yet, chef since about 2004-ish, culinary school. I own some restaurants, food truck, personal chef, kind of kind of did a little bit of everything. Uh Lived in the city, kind of got burned out on that in the restaurant life, and me and my wife packed up and moved to the country on 40 acres and try to hunt, fish, and live off the land much as you can. That's awesome. So where where did your uh, passion for food all start, and was it originally wild game, or did it kind of progress into that as time went on? Uh, definitely came from my, my grandmother. I grew up next door to her, and uh, she was a phenomenal cook, and used to throw down every weekend and uh on the holidays you know she would throw down a gauntlet of food um kind of kind of picked it up from her i was always over there she basically raised me outside of my <laughs> my parents um i got in the wild game thing probably in my teens just maybe a little bit of squirrel and venison but i didn't really get into it hardcore until early 30s really wow so uh what what kind of stuff was your grandmother cooking and is it something that's kind of uh impacted you and, and how you cook now? Is it something that kind of followed along with your career or, or uh is it just something that kind of make it home? Um kind of came full circle, you know, we're from the south and she would cook all the staple dishes and just pretty much any any southern food, man, she just you know, just threw it down. Um I ended up moving to South Florida with the Coast Guard, and I got very involved in uh, Latin American food, like Cuban food and all that stuff, so I was pretty heavy into that, and then uh, I got stationed in the Charleston, South Carolina, and that put me back in the Southern food movement, and uh, that kind of 
kind of took me back over, but you know, um, it's pretty, the Southern food is pretty refined. So I kind of, you know, took my grandmother's stuff and, and the stuff I was learning here and kind of started refining that. So would you say it's almost kind of like a fusion, some of the stuff you do? Yeah, I would say I, I still do cook a lot of Latin American food. So you might see that influence in there, but, um, like Appalachian, uh, foothill kind of food, uh, Charleston, South Carolina, low country style food, seafood, um, a good mix of that. Very nice. Very nice. So when, uh, when your grandmother cooked, I'm just kind of curious cause I always, you know, think of my grandmothers and, uh, the different things that they cooked and it was always their specialty dish. What was their one thing that kind of stood out that, that you still think of today? Uh, I would say chicken. There's two for me, chicken and dumplings and, uh, and it's not really Southern, but corned beef and hash, she would, those are my two favorites. Nice. She would cook. So, so with the chicken and dumplings, how was she going about that? Was it dumplings dropped into the, like the thicker type of, uh, like almost like a gravy on the chicken. It was so thick that the broth was thickened into it or how, how did that go? It was kind of thickened with the, uh, with the dough that's dropped in there. So she would cook a whole chicken, kind of simmer that in there, pull that out, pick off all the meat throw that back in there, season it up, and then hit it with the uh, with the dough, whether it was biscuits or homemade dough, and drop that in there and kind of use that to thicken it up a little bit. That's making me hungry right now. Some fresh celery and onions thrown in there and some <laughs> oh, diced yeah. up carrots. and Oh, man, that's good stuff right there for sure. So let's kind of talk about your food trucks and stuff like that. How, how did that kind of evolve into that? At what point were you like, okay, you know, I'm going to do this and, and uh, you know, kind of have a food truck and restaurant and, like, what what took you in that direction versus just kind of learning to cook at home or, or do that kind of stuff? Um, so I went, so I went to culinary school with the Coast Guard, got out, wanted to kind of refine my skills, went back to culinary school, um, worked as a personal chef in culinary school. And then uh, as I was in culinary school, I also got a job in uh, one of the nicest fine dining restaurants here. So then I kind of went that avenue. Got pretty involved in that, graduated, and then work, went and worked for a really nice uh, hotel on Kiowa Island, South Carolina. And uh, it was, I don't want to piss anybody off, but it was kind of like, it was such fancy food. I feel like, you know, I was like a servant, you know what I mean? It was mm-hmm. just like this ultra fancy food. And that kind of, I wanted to go a different direction. Um, I uh, I got out of that, went to another fancy hotel, but I ran there, actually ran their, uh, their breakfast shift in the mornings. Uh, and the personal chef at night and then develop my food truck concept while I was doing that. And then, and then dove into the, the food truck scene. Um, I just wanted to go, you know, a little bit late, more laid back and, and be able to cook while I wanted to. Right. So, so when, when you ended up doing the food truck, what kind of food was it on the food truck? It was uh, Latin American street food. Oh. So I would kind of, <laughs> kind so of give like me a, a run through of the menu. Cause that sounds, I love, uh, like, Latin American, uh, Cuban type, uh, all that kind of food. I mean, that is, is like one of my all time favorites. If I'm in a city, that's a big city and I know they've got some good restaurants or something of that kind of style food. I'm definitely, that's my first pick. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun, man. I, uh, I changed the menu like probably two or three times a week. Um, there, there was some stuff I would keep on there, but I was just constantly, you know, trying to challenge myself and try new things. But, I mean, anything from Cuban sandwiches, tacos, um, pupusas, arepas. I mean, a little bit of everything, in all honesty. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Yeah. That's good stuff. So then it kind of pivoted, and like you said, you know, a little bit in your teens, and then later on in your 30s when you really started uh, getting into the hunting. How did it, I mean, progress and start out? Like, what were you going after first? Because, I mean, obviously a chef's perspective is slightly different than, you know, your average hunter, especially like a whitetail hunter. It seems like, uh, you know, if they if they don't do it themselves, it seems like they always go after, you know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but salamis and different things like that. I'm sure you were interested in specific cuts and things like that. What, what were you kind of looking for when you got into it and started doing it? Um, in all honesty, I was like, just trying to keep it in its its freshest form, I guess you could say. And I wasn't really trying to dive into it and try to manipulate the flavors. I just I just wanted to kind of start with the basics and and just try to see what it was all about, all the flavor profiles in it, and then and kind of go from there. I would I wasn't really into uh, I guess coming up with all these crazy dishes at first. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, 
So, I mean, what were you pursuing as far as game? Everything, or was it uh, kind of specific what you were chasing to try and tailor make some meals? Are you talking about what, like species and stuff? Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it's whitetail, uh, wild boar, squirrels, uh, rabbits. Um, I've, I've made it out west a couple times. I haven't gotten <laughs> lucky enough to get anything that close, <laughs> but I've got some buddies that uh, – <laughs> Got to go. Got to go on a trip that I actually had to, to bail out on, um, and and got some good meat and uh, sent it my way uh, to help me out. So I've I've got some friends that give me some Western meat. <laughs> yeah, you know I uh, I am in that same category as you as far as uh, Western hunts and and success rate is zero. So I'm uh, I'm with you on that. Hopefully that'll change here in the near future. But uh, you know you never know. Um, so what kind of meat was it? Was it bear meat, elk meat, or, uh, what kind of species? Um, antelope and mule deer. And I've, I've had, uh, it's been probably about four or five years, had elk. Um, actually one of the restaurants I worked at, uh, circa 1886, uh, that head chef was actually pretty big in the wild game. I want to say he was from Texas or something, but, uh, you ever heard of Broken Arrow Ranch? Is that like West Texas? Um, I was talking about it the other I'm day. Not, I'm not sure. Yeah, it's 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 just a uh, a company that is they're 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 legally allowed to sell uh, true wild game. Oh, okay. So they they actually go out to different ranches, or if if a rancher has a problem or whatever, they can literally you know snipe off a you know wild deer or, or venison or, or whatever, and they have a truck. They can get everything cooled down and processed, and they they actually get it USDA approved to sell it to restaurants. Um, so I actually cooked antelope a lot uh in that restaurant as well back in the day that's pretty cool that's that's uh something that you don't hear of too often um so let's kind of get into like what uh you and i talked a little bit beforehand about you know foraging and stuff like that like what are you kind of looking for right now for some of the dishes that you're you know coming up with or making or uh you know preparing this uh this time of year uh, for me around here, it's definitely going to be chanterelles. That's the easiest for me to find. And when you do find them, you usually find a, a pretty huge patch. <laughs> <laughs> so what are you doing with them? What What do you, I mean, like simple, like uh, saute and butter or, I mean, what, what kind of stuff are you making with it? Uh, pr- pretty simple, man, with, with mushrooms. I mean, back in the day, I would make different sauces and whatnot. And I feel like it, you know, would mask it, but with, uh, chanterelles i'm either just sauteing them in butter with a little bit of vinegar at the end or maybe a little bit of wine to to elevate the the flavors a little bit um i would say the most i would do is kind of make like a chanterelle compound butter or something which can't really go wrong with that i mean that's probably as elaborate that i'll get with the with the mushrooms um i have made mushroom terrines and stuff like that i mean you can get into the in the into the crazy stuff that stuff's delicious but uh not not many people are gonna put in there to make them so so explain a tur- terrine for me because that's like french cuisine um what exactly is that so it's basically you can you can you can make them with vegetables or meat um usually when i make them um i've done like a wild boar terrine it's basically like a sausage uh kind of like force meat um it can be blended with cream and and the meat or it can just be emulsified with the fat, and uh, you can use different binders. Um, the type of grind is gonna that you use is gonna uh, alter the texture. Um, but but the main one that I would usually make is a, a wild boar and a, um, uh, pretty much any kind of wild mushroom terrine. So you would have a terrine mold that's I don't know about 13, 12 inches long and a few inches wide. You would put down a layer of uh, wild boar. Um, have pre-cooked, like poached uh, mushrooms or gently sauteed, put that in the middle and then top that back off with more pork or you can fill it with other stuff. And you would put that in a water bath in the oven and cook it at about 300 degrees. And as soon as it hits about 150, 155, you pull it out, um, put something on top of it to compress it, throw it in the fridge overnight. And when you pull it out the next day, it's kind of completely compressed, no air pockets, and the mushrooms will be kind of like in the center of it. So when you slice into it, you're getting like almost like a spam looking yeah. slice of meat with, with a mushroom and laid in the middle. Okay. Yeah. So I know what you're talking about now. I've seen it, never done it, never actually tasted it. For some reason, I've got a, still a slight like aversion to, to cold foods that, you know, or meat, you know what I mean? Like other than like maybe oh, like yeah. a lunch meat or something, but something that's prepared that, 
you know, like I could still take like a, you know, a chicken leg out of the fridge and, and gnaw into that. But for some reason, I don't know, stuff like that just still kind of skeeps me out. I haven't quite got to oh, yeah. that level of eating that, but I, I probably should. <laughs> I probably should give, and, it, and, give it a whirl. And they actually are delicious to, um, uh, you can actually kind of sear it up, you know, like let's say you are cooking spam. Matter of fact, I just made some old mate spam, but, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, you can crisp those up in a non, uh, a non stick skillet. And, uh, and they're actually pretty good too if you don't like the cold meats. So would that be kind of like a scrapple at that point then, or? Uh... <laughs> yeah, I mean it kind of resembles it. Yeah. No, honestly, yeah. Okay. All right, and that's something uh, that you don't find too often around here by me in the Midwest. But but uh, when you get over into the eastern, southeastern states, it's kind of pretty pretty commonplace as far as that goes. Yeah, I grew up eating uh, liver, which is almost the same thing. I want to say it's the the coarseness of it's different, but I grew up eating uh, liver pudding. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty much the same thing, but I think it's a finer texture. Yeah. That's all interesting things. So let's kind of talk about some stuff uh, that you've got in the works. Uh, some pretty cool things coming down the pipeline as far as, uh, you know, uh, some learning courses and stuff like that, that you've got going on. Yeah. Um, I joined, uh, outdoor class uh it's powered by uh go hunt and um uh, i think Corey jacobson is a, a big partner into it i, I think i think with a uh, elk 101 rocky mountain uh, elk foundation um it's basically kind of be like a uh master class platform so you basically pay for a subscription and then it's going to have uh wild game chefs on there um uh honey experts like randy newberg uh remy warren and so basically you could learn uh, with one wild game chef, you can learn how to do different kinds of cooking techniques, or it could be elk specific. And I think with Remy, he's teaching mule deer hunting, and then uh, Corey Jakes can, I think, elk calling. And I want to say right now there's maybe 12, 12 yeah. people on there right now. Yeah, I, I was actually, I just kind of was looking through that for the first time. And so, like, uh, Brian Call, Ryan Lampers, uh, Mark Livesey, he's going to be doing the e scouting. And that guy is just. The stuff that he does with that e-scouting is just phenomenal. And he's got his own class, uh, Treeline Academy. And okay. and it is mind-boggling that a man has learned how to do that much because I'm pretty computer illiterate. And to know that he <laughs> is such a nerd when it comes to computers that he just, I mean, he obsesses about it. And you can tell, I've sat down and watched him teach a course before and actual live course and and listening to him go on and on and the fact that like if somebody has a question he's going to field every single question that you have and keep going and going until he runs out of time where they physically have to say hey no more we've got other time slots we have to fill <laughs> um it, but but to see see how much he's done and developed and put into his course like it's it's amazing to see that too so i'm kind of excited because the caliber of people that you've surrounded yourself in that group and you, it shows testament to who you are and what you're doing and, and, uh, you know, the good things that are uh, coming out of your way. So it, it's kind of nice to see, um, see all those people get together and, you know, hopefully put, put something amazing together that, you know, people can actually benefit from. Right. So that's a good thing. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I heard that for a limited time, all Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month. When you purchase a three-month plan, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless service online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer, go to mintmobile.com slash waypoint. $45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited, man. I think it's going <laughs> to be one of the best tools out there. So, so have you started uh, recording or planning or doing any of those things for it yet, or is that coming in the future? 
Um, every, everything's written. Um, we haven't filmed yet, but the course is, uh, is written for me. Um, they, they gave me full, you know, free range for that. So I, I wrote the whole thing. Can you, can you speak to any of that or is that not allowed at this point? Uh, I, I can say, um, it's, it's based on, uh, wild game cooking techniques. So rather than focus on a, a specific, um, species, I'm kind of, uh, try, trying to teach some techniques that everybody can learn and then kind of carry that, carry that over to different, you know, species. So if like, maybe if you, if you learn like a cool technique from me, uh, maybe you can, um, kind of hone in on that and perfect it. And then, you know, you take Hank Shaw's course, maybe you can, you know, try one of my techniques on his and kind of elevate, not that he, you know, he's, he's a badass, he knows what he's doing, but you know, I'm, I'm hoping I can, you know, broaden people's you know range and how they cook. Yeah, that's one of the things, and and you know, talking to Hank and and learning from him and uh, getting to discuss different things. Like my new obsession this summer is really trying to nail down cooking fish in different ways. Um, you know, yeah. besides just um, you know, besides just fillets and frying them up, or, or you know. Uh, baking them in the oven or something like that. I really want to try and take it to the next level just to see uh, different things. Like I've never fried a whole fish, never done that yet. Um, You know, it's just something that, that I was kind of, it seems intimidating, right. To do these different things in in different ways or make some type of sauce. Is there anything that like you do that's a kind of a fun or simple and easy way to cook fish. That's kind of different than, you know, the way most people traditionally do it. Um, here, um, in the low country, we, I mean, I, I had the luxury of, of living at, like I think I mentioned before in the Florida Keys, so I had some good fish out there, but, um, here a big thing was like cooking whole fried flounder. Okay. And you would basically, uh, you, you would basically do like a, a cross section cut on each side and like leave little, like maybe half inch squares, uh, a half inch square pattern on both sides of the flounder. And that would be, you know, battered in various things could be cornmeal or flour or whatnot and that would be fried whole that's a uh, a pretty big deal uh around here um one of the best dishes i had that i kind of kind of uh ripped off <laughs> there's an awesome thai restaurant here <clears throat> and they do a whole fried flounder with a uh, like this sweet thai sauce and, oh, and serve man. it over rice it's, it's very simple but it is one of the best fried fish dishes i've ever had in my life <laughs> so let's kind of dive into that as far as the sauce so when you're because like that's the other thing that kind of intimidates me is making like some elaborate sauce or in my head it seems like it's elaborate so what because i just recently um elevated my pepper game so <laughs> because i mean in my house and you know just kind of commonplace it's it, you cook with pretty much black peppercorns, red peppercorns, whatever. But I'd recently got Aleppo pepper and, um, okay. I'm trying to think of what the other one is, but it's kind of a, a sweeter smelling pepper. Uh, gosh, no, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but, um, anyway, so I've recently upped my pepper game and I'm going to try and utilize that in some things and try and figure it out. But what's like, how do, how do you go about making a sauce for things like that and, you know, adding chili flakes or whatever to it? Uh, it's kind of, I kind of cheat in all honesty. And I, okay. I, I picked these up. I, I picked this one technique up off of, um, I can't remember his name. It's a really popular Asian chef. And I picked this up actually back up on the, on the food truck and I was cooking Peruvian food and Peruvian food is heavily influenced by Asian food. Um, but anyway, it would take, um have you ever had like the, the, the sweet chili like a maypoy sauce it's uh, it's kind of like an orange's hue it has little flakes all through it yes but, yes um, i love that type of sauce <laughs> don't know how to make it though it, it, it used to be hard to find it. you can find it about anywhere but if you, if you buy that you can kind of use that as a base okay um and one of the best sauces i have for fish it's um you would mix that with uh water fish sauce sugar vinegar and ginger and you can either mix that up and eat it as is or you can actually reduce that down a little bit um until it thickens up just a tad bit and and that's that's really delicious on a, on fried fish um and, and it's super easy so then like after that like in my mind i'm thinking like 
dice up some scallions or some green onion and some toasted sesame seeds on top or something like that maybe yeah you uh you can do that um you can make them yourself or they actually sell these uh in uh, asian markets some uh fried you can buy pre-fried shallots pre-fried garlic sounds gross but it's actually delicious you can fry chicken fish or whatever and then hit that at the end you buy it pre-fried yeah, it sounds sounds crazy, but if you go into a special to Asian market, it'll be fried shallots and fried garlic. Um, okay, you can finish your yeah, you can finish your dishes off of that, and it's <laughs> it's pretty good. Okay, yeah, because that's something that like I really want to do. I haven't done it yet. I think I'm gonna buy a wok just so I can fry a fish whole in it because it seems like a waste of oil and stuff in you know a giant. So oh uh, yeah. Um, let me let me ask you this then. So, it's like, let's say you're frying a fish. You're frying it in a wok. The fish is done cooking, and whatever oil you have in there, would you then like maybe take chilies and infuse that oil and make sauce out of that oil that's left over in the wok, or would you do that separately? Uh, it would depend on what kind of oil it is. I guess you could say. Okay. Um, you you. <sighs> You could, but you, you would have to experiment with it. Okay. I mean, I couldn't promise you it would, it would turn out good. If, yeah, it all <laughs> honestly depends on, yeah, you would, you would have to let it cool down and actually taste the oil by itself. Um, all right. Okay. Yeah. But, so, but, but that being said, if you make your own fried garlic or something like that on the side, um, that, that's actually pretty good. So you can take your fried garlic and then, you know, save the leftover oil from that or your shallots. And, and that's kind of a little infused oil. Okay. So, I, leads me to the next question. Say you were frying your own shallots or garlic or things like that. What type of oil would you use? Would it be like a sesame oil or or something with like even a higher smoke point? Yeah, I would I would use something probably neutral. Um, you could probably get away with a, a straight olive oil, maybe. Um, you could use that or just canola avocado oil. I mean, me, I'm somewhat of a health nut, so I'd probably use avocado oil. Okay. Um, I tried to use see- coconut oil. I try to steer away from, uh, you know, cottonseed oil and, and canola oil yeah. and things like that, vegetable oils. Um, I always try and go with the healthier. So, yes, avocado oil or, like, have you experimented at all with, like, uh, hickory nut oil or acorn oil or any of those things? Uh, I've used a lot of different nut oil. I've cooked with, like, walnut, macadamia. I love hazelnut oil. Um was another one I used. I want to say it was, this is a few years ago. I heard from another chef. I think it was like okra. It's like an okra seed oil. Okay. Sounds weird. That's but that interesting. Was a, but, that, <laughs> but that was more for like a finishing oil. You know what I mean? Not really to cook with. It was like salad dressings or whatnot. Yeah. So I got some, um, I don't know if you know who Sam Thayer is, but he is like foragers harvest and he does a lot of different mm-hmm. foraging things. In fact, like, mm-hmm. He's pretty much the the book writer for your modern day foraging books, um, but he has his own little storefront, and I got some acorn oil from him, and I ended up making a venison stir fry <laughs> with shiitake mushrooms that and oyster mushrooms that I grew. Um, then I had to. It was winter time though, so I grew the mushrooms indoors. So I had those. I had my own venison roast that I sliced into just super, super thin slices. And then, you know, snow peas, carrots, some other things in there. And uh, threw that all on a blackstone and cooked it in acorn oil. And then threw in some ginger and garlic right towards the end. And that honestly was some of the best (laughs) stir fry that I'd had with that that, with the acorn oil and and I was like oh my gosh actually I shouldn't be saying this but we actually cooked it at work (laughs) so it was me and another (laughs) guy in a group effort yeah (laughs) in the break room on a black stone but uh, that's awesome and yeah uh, I'd love to give me some hands on that stuff yeah so I mean that was a that was a pretty good thing and it's just some reason that acorn oil, it doesn't have like quite the heat that sesame, sesame oil kind of brings to it, but it's got okay. uh, a real richness to the flavor that's a little bit more of a flavor profile than the sesame oil does have. And it's got a fairly okay. high smoke point to it too. So it, it uh, man, that was good. That was, 
just thinking about it like makes me want to cook it again. But that was one of the things that I cooked that uh, was pretty amazing. What's some of the stuff that you do that you kind of adapt wild game like venison or something into um, like South American cuisine or something like that that you kind of turn into? You know, are you making like uh, venison arepas or you know stuff like that, or what? What kind of stuff are you making with the uh, with wild game? Um, a, a little bit of everything, in all honesty. Um, I, I just posted one. It was kind of kind of fancy. Uh, wasn't really something I would normally make. Um, it was a like a, a fancier spin on uh, the Peruvian lomo saltado, which is kind of like a Peruvian Tifa kind of dish, um, heavily Asian influenced. If I remember correctly, I actually served them a food truck as a sandwich, uh, but it was it was like a soy based sauce with with ginger, um, traditionally beef. I use venison, um, and uh, it has French fries in it with the stir fry, uh, okay. which I thought was was pretty funny. So I wanted to put like an elevated spin on it, so I took a um, a venison flank. And um, I think I put some cilantro in there, green onion, um, some different spices, and lined the center up with uh, fingerling potatoes. And uh, I rolled that up and tied it with butcher's twine and um, and uh, kind of simmered, braised that. Um, got lucky. It uh, ended up coming out perfectly with the uh, the potatoes in the middle cooked, you know, at the exact same time the, uh, the, uh, the flanks were tender. Um, let that kind of chill and then sliced into it and everything kind of, you know, held its shape. Um, and I served that with the, uh, the soy, the soy braise. Um, I reduced that down to like a jus. So did and, you, uh, did you marinate it ahead of time, um, or anything like that to, to kind of give it some additional moisture or anything or, or no? No. Uh, yeah. Cause it's, it's, it's braised in a, uh, a pretty flavorful broth, I guess you could say. And it, I mean, it probably took three or three or four hours. And, and usually, what I'll do for for a braise like that, um, to me, they're better the next day. So I'll kind of let that sit in the actual braising liquid overnight, and it'll kind of absorb more of that flavor and kind of concentrate a little bit more. Um, to me, that's any kind of braised dish can honestly, I think, benefit from overnight sit in the fridge. Okay. Yeah. That's, uh, any kind of peppers or uh different type of chilies or anything like that in the sauce, or was it kind of more of just a soy type, uh, base? Yeah. yeah it's more, more, more of a soy. It had, um, I want to say I stuffed it with bell peppers too. Um, cause the star fry actually had peppers in it. I, I cooked so many random things, man. After <laughs> everything I put in there. Yeah. Um, that sounds, sounds good though. And, and, uh, so was it, is the traditional dish actual like French fries, French fries in the stir fry, or is that something that? I, I think so. It's just like a weird, you know, kind of a street food kind of. So I wonder if they deal. pre-cook them or they cook them in the, um, in the stir fry. You know what I mean? Like, is it? Do you think they're pre-fried and then thrown in? Well, when I did mine, I I did them pre-fried. Okay. Okay, you did. Yeah. So you would, so so you would stir fry everything, have the the fries already cooked hit that in there, kind of get the, uh, the fries coated in the, in the fat you're cooking in, and then hit it with the soy and just kind of glaze it. Interesting. That sounds, sounds pretty good. Uh, <laughs> might be something yeah, I'm going to have to look it up and, uh, maybe, maybe try and play around with that. One thing I want to ask you though, is, uh, sous vide cooking. Do you, do you play around with that a lot? Uh, <laughs> I might make some people mad. <laughs> no um we so which it's been out for a while it, it, it kind of got popular back when i was in culinary school um you know with with el bouilly and uh Ferran Adria, um mm -hmm. that's when molecular molecular gastronomy as they called it back in the day kind of popped off um we, we cooked with them back then and we kind of toyed with them before the craze kind of hit mainstream and i kind of got burnt out on it back then um unless it's used to in my eyes for what it's supposed to be used for um i don't think i would ever use it to cook a steak like I, i've done it in restaurants and i think it's cool and everything but for me um cooking something like if you're going like uh like farm raised meat let's say you're going to cook a short rib 
that you normally are going to braise so it's cooked completely through. Um, I think it's cool to use a sous vide to uh, throw a short rib on there and cook it for like, you know, 30 some hours. It breaks everything down and you still got like a medium, medium rare temperature on the short rib. So it kind of alters the way it's supposed to be cooked. Um, I think they're cool using it like that. Uh, as far as using it for a steak, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mess with it. But I do think squirrels and, 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 and chicken benefit from it because you can, you know, load that bag up with butter and aromatics or whatever and kind of have that thing um, cook perfectly and, and throw it on the grill. I, I feel like that benefits from it greatly. So I got one and I played with it and I actually did make a steak with it and a roast. And I was like, man, this is not the best way to do this. Like when, when I cook a steak, whether it be a deer steak or a, you know, a backstrap tenderloin, whatever, most of the time tenderloin hits that frying pan with some butter and some rosemary right away and, uh, or some thyme and that's it. You know, a little bit of garlic salt or sometimes I go foraging and, you know, ramp salt I'll make and like sprinkle just a little bit of that on there and it gives them that like allium type you know, flavor, garlic slash onion flavor, and that's it. Like nothing else, nothing fancy. And and when I put it in there and tried to do like a reverse sear on it, it just, it was not as good as, you know, letting a flame kiss it. Or um, like a lot of times I'll take and put steaks or whatever, just a real light coat of salt, maybe a little bit more of that ramp salt instead of the salt, and then just a real light film of oil on it, like real, real light. And I'll give it like 20 minutes with a smoke tube on my oh, Traeger, yeah. and which gives it a little bit of smoke. For some reason, I don't know, the Traeger, on, unless you have it obviously on smoke setting, it doesn't get that much smoke flavor. So I'll give it like 15 minutes with a smoke tube and on smoke, and then I'll crank that grill up, take it off, wait till it gets real hot, throw it back on, and give it a sear. And that's, you know, like to me, that's, that's the best way to eat a steak is uh, get that sear on both sides and then call it a day, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, in my eyes, you know, it's not worth it. Um, in a restaurant setting, you know, we've worked, we did some banquets or whatever where you got to have, like, you know, 100 filet mignons cooked to medium rare. Uh, I think that's, you know, that 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 can come in handy, you know, if you got to do that and you want to cook 100 steaks, you know, perfectly at the same time. <laughs> Yeah, I remember all the way back when I was in college, a kid was in my class, and I went a little bit later uh, in life, but um, I was, we were in, I I can't even remember what class we were in together, but he was also in culinary, and so we got to talk about food a little bit, and one of the things that he mentioned was he liked using a sous vide back then and would render down duck fat and cook Mm -hmm. like turkey legs in the duck fat and infuse, you know, that duck fat flavor into them. Stuff like that where you needed to break down the meat a little yeah. bit more. And that seems pretty logical to me, especially with, like, a wild turkey. It seems like a really good thing for that. And in my mind, I just I want to make tacos out of everything because I love yeah. tacos, right? And who doesn't? <laughs> but, um, you know, throw some different stuff in there, and some seasoning, some cumin and garlic and maybe some smoked paprika, whatever, and, get some good flavoring out of it and make something like that. And then now that you mentioned squirrels, I didn't even think of that. But so like, can you kind of walk me through something that you would do with squirrels in that sous vide and what you would make? Uh, I, I would kind of treat it like a, uh, kind of maybe like dark meat chicken or something, you know, man, just throw some aromatics, uh, rosemary or whatever seasoning you want. You don't have to, you know, go the traditional route, some garlic and just kind of, you know, cook that in there. I might have to experiment with the time um, and then just pull that off and probably grill it or throw it in a cast iron pan and baste it with some butter to keep it moist. Um, uh, stuff like that really, you know, kind of has me wanting to buy <laughs> one to, to mess around with next year. Like, like to me, that gets me going like just. Yeah. yeah. Or like to me, like um, carnitas, like, so maybe you could throw it in and with, you know, different seasoning or something in like the sous vide and then take it out and then like crisp it up in the pan afterwards to get kind of that like crispy outside edge of the carnitas, but you're still breaking down the the squirrel meat to where it's a little bit more tender. Something like that might be pretty good too. I love some carnitas. (laughs) Yeah. My, uh, actually I want to say I invented this technique of chicken wings. It was, uh, I came out with this, way I, I wanted to do chicken wings i was really particular about it and then uh another chef 
came out with his way of doing it in a cookbook like a few years later. And uh, I was like, man, I was like, this this really works for chicken wings. I bet that would be badass um, with with squirrel. But you would have to, um, you know, put a couple extra steps in there. But uh, I must treat it like a uh, a chicken wing. Um, so the sous vide version, you could put that in the bag with some butter, cook that till it's tender, throw that in a low temp, kind of like almost like a cold smoke. Okay. Cold smoke that for like, like an hour just to get smoke permeated on it, and then throw that into a fryer just a crisp or not even a fryer just like a, a low a, a shallow fry in a cast iron pan and crisp that up and then have you like whether it's asian sauce or buffalo sauce and then toss that in your sauce um wow that's a lot of work but if, if you had like 10 squirrels uh that would be to me a pretty epic meal that's been on my in, in my to-do list on my in some of my notebooks for about five years now so so when you say it. that you're talking like a whole squirrel leg throw the squirrel leg in there like and do it or, or are you talking just like whole squirrel or how how would you go about that then? either i i've thought about it in two ways i've thought about uh doing the whole squirrel and just kind of uh, seeing how that laid uh played out or literally che- treating like chicken wings and, and you're just cutting off the legs and and doing it that way um i'd probably yeah. do it both ways in all honesty so i recently stumbled and be honest about it, i think it was tiktok which I hate to admit that, you know, you find cool things on TikTok, but every <laughs> once in a while out of all the stupid stuff, you get a nugget of wisdom. And one of the things I did uh, was making sure your chicken wing is completely dry, putting baking powder on the chicken wing, and then baking it in the oven at like 350 for, I think, about six, 65 to something minutes somewhere in there 50 to 65 minutes depending on you know the size of the chicken wing and it comes out so freaking crispy really oh my goodness it is so crispy like that with that baking powder on there i don't know what i'm huh. sure there's some type of reaction or whatever it does and it dries out the skin and makes it crispy yeah. meats moist inside still you know the bone's hot uh you can see like it starts to shrink away from the bone you know when it's done um yeah but that skin stays crispy enough to where when you put it in your sauce and shake it, it's still got a crunch to it, even though the sauce is kind of permeated all around it. And that is a really good chicken wing like that. So huh. I don't know. You couldn't do it with that, it. but it makes me think about like frog legs, maybe uh, trying to do them that way. Um, I don't know. Somehow you'd have to still come up with some type of breading or something, but just a higher volume of baking powder versus yeah. whatever you're doing to get that real crispy and like bake them instead of trying to deep fry them that way you're not getting so much uh huh. cholesterol <laughs> and all yeah. the things that you oh, yeah, don't definitely. need you know i'm always trying to come up with other ways to be a little bit healthier than you know than than some of the older recipes out there that you know then again who knows i mean look at how long people live back then especially in appalachia and so all the stuff they used to deep fry and eat and all that kind of stuff oh too, yeah so. man. <laughs> strike lard yeah which hey lard bear fat bear fat's probably one of the best things you could probably cook with but you know yeah i would rather eat that than uh canola oil any day yeah for sure <laughs> so what are some other things you're kind of looking forward to doing this summer kind of cooking and and playing around with maybe i mean you looking forward to cooking outside on some type of special grill or open wood you know wood coals or what what do you got plans for um I just finished building a uh, a cob oven uh, that, that's wood fired and kind of like a, a live fire kitchen set up on either side or the or either side of the um, of the oven has a uh, like a stone windbreak wall so you can kind of put your cooking contraption on there and kind of get a windbreak to keep your your uh, heat retained. Um, I'm looking to play around with that quite a bit this summer. I've got a uh, I don't know the actual name for them. Uh, it's like an Argentinian, like uh, iron cross, call it like crucifix that you can put like a whole hog on or a lamb or just strap any kind of piece of meat and have that thing kind of angled um, over the fire. I uh, got one of those contraptions. Uh, got a, uh, a wood fired plancha, a big uh, kind of almost like a walk, I guess you could say. It, was, it actually came from Argentina. It looks like a giant walk, um, something you would either stir fry or make the heat is in. Um, looking to break that thing out. Yeah, that sounds good. So 
a um, few things. I think I saw the the oven you're talking about, and that's the one like where you packed all the clay around the top of it and made like the kind of dome looking thing on it around like the yeah. the vent pipe and stuff. That was, that looks pretty cool. Have you played around with it at all yet, or no? Uh, I I literally just lit my last um, kind of like prep. I guess you would call it like a prep fire, like a curing fire or something. To yeah, kinda, like yeah. a curing fire. Okay. Um, and so I've got a buddy coming into town that uh, um, that was kind of helping me put the clay together or whatever in the beginning. He's coming back into town on uh, Saturday, so I think the first meal is going to be cooked in it this weekend. That's awesome. That's so cool. So then uh, the the Iron Cross thing you were talking about, the crucifix or what what was the actual name? It's called. Um, I don't. I want to say they call it like an asador or something. Okay. I might be and that's, but if, if, that's the one where like they get a big, big fire going and they let it break down into coals, right? Like they just keep piling wood on and, and then they get the coals and then like it'll either lean kind of over it a little bit and they rotate it. Or I see yep. where they have one where it like stands straight up and it pivots. Like it's got the two arms of the cross on it actually like spin around the main pole. And they have like strings hanging down off of it, and like the meat almost twirls on it, right? Is that like a? And I think I've seen them cook chickens like that too. And they have the string, and you just kind of keep they keep twisting the string every once in a while, and it spins so the chicken's yeah. kind of almost like on a rotisserie the whole time. Is that the kind of what I, you I, got going? Yeah, I kind of started building the. Uh, I guess it kind of looks like a bird cage, but I've built mine a little bit different. Um, I've got something like that. I started building. I need to finish. Um, the, uh, the iron cross, the solder is exactly what you were saying. You can, uh, you can pitch it at different angles. Uh, you can spin it around, have, it, uh, you know, vertical. Um, it's actually cooked. The first thing I cooked on it was some wild hog ribs and, uh, you know, there weren't as tender as if you were throwing it in the smoker, but they turned out, you know, still falling off the bone and turned out pretty good. Man, that makes me want to go shoot a bunch of hogs. Now I haven't, I haven't <laughs> shot any in a while and I, I should have done better when I did have my hog to try and, you know, do different things. But at the time I just didn't have the time to cook very many things. And I just did a few dishes with it and, and I tried smoking some, um, and it was just a little too tough. It needed like a lower, slower type of method. I tried throwing it in one of them barrel okay. cookers, you know, um, and it just, it wasn't that great, but, uh, I need to get some eating size hogs, I think, and try and do some different dishes with them and maybe even try and do a whole hog, you know, something. I, I just, I feel like I got to play around with it again now after you saying that, because it sounds good. And, uh, I might have to hit you up for those plans. Do you, you do quite a bit of hog hunting? I have not done hog okay. hunting in, in, uh, probably gosh, eight, nine years, but yeah, I did it okay. a couple times before then. And I always had fun. Uh, one time my buddy and I went out and uh, we, we use bows and he used his long bow and man, them things are tough. Uh, my brother-in-law <laughs> ended up shooting the same hog my buddy did. And my buddy's like, no, I hit it. It was laying down sunning and he came up behind it real early in the morning and shot it through, uh, through the backside of the rib cage and watched his arrow bury in all the way to the fletching. And, uh, you know, he's like, I know I took out at least one lung and maybe heart. Well, he ended up taking out one lung and puncturing the other lung. And uh, the only reason we know that is because my brother-in-law shot the same hog. And uh, we had it hanging, dressing it out. And sure enough, there was my buddy's shaft from his wooden shaft from his uh, longbow arrow stuck inside of it. And it was like, That's holy crazy. cow. It was a day later. A day later, That's he nice. shot that same hog. So, I mean, th them things are tough. My favorite thing, I actually built a uh, 30 caliber AR-15 that I like taking out and playing with. It's 762 by 39, and I've got 168 grain 762 by 39 projectiles that I uh, <laughs> I use, and that that goes through both shoulder blades and drops them on the spot. So, oh that's, man, that's pretty fun. <laughs> In fact, I've got a hog head from gosh eight years that I've been meaning to kind of take down and do a skull mount. I just haven't had time to get around to it for my buddy. Uh, my buddy's in a wheelchair and he got, actually got to go out with us on a hog hunt. And that was his first time ever out hunting. And uh, so I've got it for him. I just haven't gotten around to doing it for him. Oh, yeah. but, but I need to, once I get boiling some skulls here, I've got a couple other ones that I need to 
get going. So once I do those, I'll bust that out and get that made up for him. So that'll be kind of cool. Give that to him because he's probably already yeah. forgot about it. But uh, <laughs> yeah. So do you do a lot of, a lot of hog hunting then, or? Uh... Yeah, um, my my property is kind of, of flooded with them. I guess you could say. Um, I don't really hunt them until after after deer season. I usually hunt them, uh, you know, January first until maybe like around March first. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I could, I could shoot one probably, you know, every couple of days if I wanted to. <laughs> probably <laughs> wouldn't even put that big of a dent in them either. That's what's crazy about hogs, you know, but <laughs> no, no, uh, I had a buddy come down, um, this past winter, he was a younger guy. So he was all gung ho, never shot a hog before. And, uh, he, uh, actually left, left the tree stand. And came back to the tree stand. I had, I had a camera out there, uh, a cell camera, and uh, he shot shot three in one night. Uh, you know, kind of, uh, my stand was right behind the pond, so he had kayaked out there. They can't hear you. Got in the stand, shot one, kayaked the, the hog back. And he did that, I think, three times that night. And then over the course of uh, three days, I want to say he got like six or seven, six or seven hogs. But uh, man, but yeah, yeah, and, and uh. Yeah, they just don't care, man. He laid down a couple. They would leave for an hour and come right back. Yeah. No, I actually uh, was down in Texas um, when they had that ice storm. What was that? Would have been not this winter, but the past winter uh, when they had that ice storm. And I was down there, and my dad, oh, yeah. my dad uh, was down there for a while, and I went and visited. And uh, I ended up not having time, but he was really trying to get me out and uh, go out there with him. And I just, I'd never had a chance. Some other family issues were kind of a little more pressing at the moment than going and sitting in a blind yeah. and shooting some hogs, but uh, <laughs> it would, it would have been fun. So, I mean, the, the opportunity yeah. is still there to get back out and do it, but just haven't, haven't really had time to put all those pieces together, but I, it sounds fun. And now that you're talking about it, it would be nice to get a couple of them and be able to try and do like a whole hog on, on the cross and uh, cook it over a big open fire like that for yeah. sure. So, Yeah. That's definitely something that's going to happen to happen. But, uh, Larry, it's been awesome talking to you, and we could probably go on about food for a long time and probably even just hogs. But uh, can you kind of tell everybody where they can find you and find all the cool stuff that, uh, you know, you're, you're cooking and uh, putting out in articles and recipes? Yeah, I'm uh, mainly active on Instagram. Uh, it's under Wild Game Gourmet. Uh, the website is thewildgamegourmet.com. Um, I'm active on both of those. Uh, you can sign up for email list. I send out recipes, uh, you know, a few times a month. If you got any questions, you can hit me up anytime. I'm, I'll pretty much answer, you know, anything you got. That's awesome. I appreciate you, uh, coming on and, and talking and educating on food. And it's always good to, you know, see what other sportsmen are out there doing and giving justice to those dishes. So it's, uh, it's always a good thing to kind of learn what everybody else is doing and get some takeaways from it and be able to take that, that wild game to the next level. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me on. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the publicly challenged podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. And if you did, please subscribe on whatever platform it is you're listening to. Also, if you could leave a review, that would help us out. And you can check us out on Instagram or at publiclychallenge.com. And once again, thank you so much for listening to the show. After years of fine print contracts and getting ripped off by overpriced wireless providers, if we've learned anything, it's that there's always a catch. So when I heard that for a limited time, all Mint Mobile wireless plans are $15 a month. When you purchase a three-month plan, I thought, what's the catch? But after talking to them, it all made sense. There isn't one. Mint Mobile's secret sauce is that they sell wireless service online. They cut out the cost of retail stores and pass those sweet savings directly to you. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer, go to mintmobile.com waypoint. 
$45 upfront payment required, equivalent to $15 a month. New customers on first three month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details.